Greetings folks, Lance here. I've actually been working on this demonstration for quite some time and the results were so phenomenal that <laughs> I had to keep redoing it just to make sure I was doing it right. And finally, I'm very assured that this demonstration is being done properly. So what is it that we're doing here? We are going to return here to what leaven actually represents in the Bible, what it means to us, what we can learn from leaven, its characteristics, how it can be applied in our lives, what God is actually doing. So this message actually builds on previous messages about leaven. It's a very important topic because the Passover, obviously the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and the Feast of Weeks along with Pentecost, leaven plays an important role in all of these. And because of this, we've actually already gone over a number of different messages. They're all very important. They all build one on top of another. And there are other messages other than the ones that are listed here. But it may be helpful for you to review these messages. But we've really barely even scratched the surface of the meaning of leaven and how it applies to our lives. It is so meaningful, but we have so much to bring in to really grasp what's going on here. It, it's, there are so many connections. And as we see more and more of the connections, it becomes more and more clear. And this is just another message that actually demonstrates through the actual physical characteristics of leaven, what God is doing. Just one more piece to the puzzle. And as I mentioned in the last message, some of these messages are very visual. And this is one of them. Now, most of it you can listen to, but when we actually get to the demonstration part itself, it's very visual. And when you see it, it will be very interesting. It is very interesting. And we'll get that we'll get to that, but we, we have some ground to cover here. Starting off, what is a way that God reveals himself? God reveals himself in many ways, but one of them we'll read here in Romans 1, verses 18 through 20. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness because what may be known of God is manifest in them for God has shown it to them for since the creation of the world his invisible attributes are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. There is so much meaning in this verse. It covers a lot of territory. It is really big. But we are going to kind of focus in on a particular area here. Because God gives us details. Reading in Exodus 25, verses 8 and 9. And let them make me a sanctuary, that I may dwell in their midst, exactly as I show you concerning the pattern of the tabernacle and of all its furniture, so shall you make it. He's pretty emphatic here. It's exactly. It's exactly because the details are important. He's showing us things through the, his creation. And specifically, the tabernacle was 
specific directions in the creation, making very detailed connections. And to emphasize, which God is very apt to do, later in the same chapter, verse 40, and see that you make them after the pattern for them, which is being shown you on the mountain. So in addition to the tabernacle, Paul talks about the broader sense of the ceremonial feast system. Reading in Hebrews 8. Now the point in what we are saying is this. We have such a high priest, one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven, a minister in the holy places, in the true tent that the Lord set up, not man. For every high priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices. Thus, it is necessary for this priest also to have something to offer. Now, if he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all, since there are priests who offer gifts according to the law. They serve as a copy, or that is, a token or a model, and shadow of the heavenly things. For when Moses was about to erect the tent, he was instructed by God, saying, See that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown you on the mountain. That's a direct quote from what we just read. But as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is as much more excellent than the old, as the covenant he mediates is better since it is enacted on better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion to look for a second. So, Paul here is drawing a connection between the heavenly and the earthly, or that is, the spiritual versus the physical. Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? And to get some context here, this comes from John 3. And the greater context is in verses 1 through 12. So we see that there are connections between the higher, that is the spiritual, and the lower, or the physical. And some of the things that are pointed out in the Bible are the tabernacle itself, the ceremonial feast system, the parables, and many may not realize this, but the miracles themselves are parables in action. They are acted out parables. And there's more. Much more. So we're going to drill down a little bit more. And we're going to be focused on this idea of the new lump. Reading in 1 Corinthians 5.7. Cleanse out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, as you really are unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Now notice, we are to specifically cleanse out the old leaven. It doesn't just say leaven, it says the old leaven. So what does it mean to be a new lump? Well, to understand this new lump, we really need to understand the characteristics of leaven. Now, we're familiar with bread. We eat leavened bread all the time. It contains yeast. And when I lived in Cincinnati, 
there was this particular neighborhood where there was actually a bread factory. Now, this wasn't just a little local bakery. It was a big factory. And when I would drive through this neighborhood, the, the aroma of yeast just permeated the entire neighborhood. And I just couldn't help but envisioning me having this fresh, hot baked yeasty bread that I would smother butter all over and just chow down. The, the smell was just so pervasive, I, I couldn't resist envisioning this. But we're not really all that familiar with the bread making process. We're just so used to just running to the store and grabbing a loaf and maybe to a local bakery where we might get this hint of the smell of bread, this yeasty smell. But we're not really familiar with the bread making process. There's a process involved, especially as it pertains to sourdough bread. Because when the Bible speaks about leaven, it's actually referring to sourdough. That is how they made bread. And it's a little bit different than the yeasty bread. Yeasty bread doesn't have that sourness. Yeasty bread is a lot lighter. It's a lot softer. Sourdough has that tangy flavor to it. It's kind of crunchy on the outside. And it's more meaty on the inside. It's a little bit different. And we don't often eat sourdough. Unless you're a big fan of it, you make a point of eating it. It's just kind of foreign to us. But what's really foreign is that we don't go through the bread making process. We don't understand how this stuff works. And there are qualities of yeast and sourdough that make it very suitable as a symbol for knowledge or doctrine, teaching, example, a way, a system, the influences in life, the ideas that we have. Now, if you haven't gone back through the 11 messages thus far, that this statement's not going to make a lot of sense. So it's very, very important to start from the beginning. And we are going to keep revisiting this because we have really only scratched the surface. We are going to keep coming back to this. But let's get through the current one. Leaven is sourdough. Sourdough, it's leavened bread. And it was the staple food for the Israelites. As it was for many other cultures of the day, there are still a lot of countries today that make bread as the staple for their diet. The majority of calories would come from bread. And bread was often baked daily, made fresh every day. Maybe they'd skip a day. Larger families could easily justify making bread every day. But they didn't just go down to the local Walmart to buy yeast packets. There was no such thing. They did not make our typical yeast bread that we eat today. Their leavened bread was based entirely upon sourdough. So again... What is sourdough bread? If you haven't gone back through the messages, you know, this particular article will really help you understand it. But it's so critical that we hit some of the highlights here in the current context. We're, we're going to revisit a lot of it. So in baking sourdough bread, every Israelite household would have what's called a mother lump of sourdough. And it contained yeast. And this was not a loaf. This was not a finished product. This was maybe the texture of Play-Doh. Um, some people, when they make it, it's a little bit more runny. But just think of it as a, a lump, a raw lump. But it contained yeast. And to bake a new loaf, they would just take a little portion of that mother lump as a starter. And they would fold and knead it into a fresh lump that they just mixed together with flour and water. And they knead it through. And they could bake it immediately. 
but often they would leave it out overnight. This allowed the yeast and the bacteria to more fully permeate the loaf. And it would develop the flavors and make it lighter. And then they'd take more flour and water and they would feed the mother loaf that they just took that little portion from. Because over time that, that mother lump would just go away and it would actually die. And we'll, we'll get to that here in a bit. But why a new lump? What, what is this idea of a new lump? And where did the original mother lump of sourdough come from? Yeah, they had them, but how did they have them in the first place? And would there be situations where the sourdough mother, it would become unusable or, or maybe less preferable to another mother lump? So we'll just go through real quickly the origin of the mother lump, where that yeast originally came from. Basically, yeast is all around us. It's everywhere. And there are various strains. It's not all just one type of yeast. But it permeates the air everywhere. In reality, there's no such thing as becoming like 100% unleavened. Every house has leaven in it. It's everywhere. And the quality of, of this yeast, it really depends a lot upon environment. Where somebody's located, the temperature, the moisture. And it's not just the yeast, but there are various strains of bacteria. And some of them are good, they're healthy for us, some of them are not so good. The good bacteria are a lot of different strains of lactobacillus. And it's these lactobacilli that produce the lactic acid in the sourdough that gives it that tangy, sour flavor. So the origin of the mother lump, it, it was created very simply. You just take a little bit of flour and water and maybe a little bit of salt. You mix it together. And because... These organisms exist in the air and they exist actually on, on the original wheat and in the flour. When we mix the flour and water together, the yeast and the bacteria begin to eat the flour. And they're very voracious. They may be small, they may be tiny, they're just little microorganisms, but there are so many of them, they start to eat the flour extremely rapidly and the yeast is actually much more aggressive at permeating a loaf and multiplying than the lactobacilli it really takes a couple weeks to get a really good tangy flavor that that sour aroma that comes from sourdough it takes about two weeks to really get it at its optimal. But as we're going to see here, the yeast is a lot more aggressive. But why a new lump? What is a new lump? Why would we desire a new lump? Well, sometimes a neighbor or a family member might have a mother lump that just produces awesome bread. Better than ours. So we might just go pay them a visit and say, hey, you mind sharing a little bit of your mother lump with me? In that case, we, we have a new starter for a new mother lump. We'll take out our old mother. We'll just pitch it in the compost or out in the garden. And we have what is to us a new lump. But for our neighbor or family member, to them it's an old lump. So it's not really a new lump. But to us it is. But maybe our lump just gets contaminated with the wrong food. There are certain things other than flour that will really attract all the wrong yeast varieties and the wrong bacteria. And if the flour is contaminated with these improper foods, it'll just attract all the wrong stuff, all the wrong microbes. 
and it will spoil the entire lump. It'll have an off smell, off color. It won't rise properly. It'll just be nasty. And at the very least, it might just be not ideal. And in that case, we just want to start over. But healthy yeast and, and bacteria, they do something to the flour, to the lump, that actually creates an environment that makes it difficult for the wrong yeast and bacteria to colonate. So as long as it's being fed properly, being taken care of, the lump will not go bad. It just needs the proper care. It needs the proper food. It needs the proper environment. But if the person who is taking care of that mother lump is basically lazy or maybe gets way too busy with other things and that mother lump is not fed regularly, ideally daily, the lump collapses. And you'll see it if you go through this process. Actually, we'll see it a little bit later on in the demonstration. It'll collapse because the yeast and, and the, the bacteria, they basically just die of starvation. They don't have anything to eat. And then that allows the bad bacteria to come in and colonize. So again, another reason where you have to start with a new lump. So we are actually going to demonstrate this process. And it's really simple. We just take a little bit of flour and a little bit of water. We mix them together. Uh, some people might use a little bit of salt in with it, but it's not necessary. Now I mentioned, I went through this process numerous times. And I was just blown away by how this developed. But we just start with some flour. And I actually tried a number of different flours, all of them without any added yeast. And in this case, this is the uh, white lily bread flour, which bread flour has a higher level of protein in it. You can really use just about any kind of flour, as long as you don't have yeast in it, to do this experiment. But... Depending on the type of flour you have, it may impact the results a bit. But you, you'll you see here how this develops. And when we mix it together, you know, this is about the size of, eh, less than the size of my fist. About half the size of my fist. And it's just flour and water mixed together. And the consistency was probably something like Play-Doh. And I just put it in this ball jar here. I put a, uh, a coffee filter over top. I rubber band a coffee filter on. It allows it to breathe, but keeps stuff out. And the next day, this is what it looks like. Not really much difference. You'll notice some settling where the lump just kind of settled into the bottom a bit more. But you'll notice right up towards the top where that peak is, that actually raised up just a hair. Just a hair. Now you may not be able to see this on a mobile phone. But if you have it on a big screen, you'll notice there right in the middle of the lump. You see a few little bubbles. Those bubbles are carbon dioxide created by the microbes that naturally occurred in the flower which basically came from the air. So wherever the flower came from, maybe there's some microbes from that region got imported here on the flower. Some of the microbes may have come from the factory where the, the flower was packed. Some of the microbes may have come from my home here in the Talladega National Forest. So there may be a mixture of microbes that occur in this lump and this is what it looks like after 24 hours but now let's go to 48 hours bam now normally i probably should have mentioned this on the prior slide i would have fed that lump but i didn't want to disturb this experiment 
this demonstration, this illustration. We're just seeing how this works. And I, and I didn't want to disturb that. But this has grown in size by over 100%. Probably 150%. And you can see clearly larger bubbles forming. It has increased in size from the activity of the yeast producing all, all this carbon dioxide. And it has actually already collapsed just a little bit. If you look at that top edge, you can see how it's kind of gone up and then started to come back down. It's running out of food because I didn't feed it the day before. So it's interesting to see all three days side by side. You don't really see anything. Obviously, the first day you don't see anything. The second day, it's like, eh, okay. But bam, look at, look at the third day. Well, I guess it would be the second day third picture two days now is that new lump unleavened or is it leavened a new lump it develops yeast it's already there but it is new yeast it is not the old leaven it is new leaven it's different than the old leaven at the end of the day when Christ was resurrected when he was at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened and they recognized him. What kind of bread was this? This was actually during the days of unleavened bread. But it was also the first day of the Feast of Weeks. The bread that Christ gave to his disciples was leavened. Artos. Not unleavened. Which is azimos. This was leavened bread. Even though it was during the days of unleavened bread. How do we resolve this? In time we'll see. There is actually a proper role for leaven. There's a place for it. There are places where it doesn't belong. There are places where it does belong, even necessary. In Leviticus 7, verses 13 and 14. With the sacrifice of his peace offerings for thanksgiving, he shall bring his offering with loaves of leavened bread. And from it he shall offer one loaf from each offering as a gift to the Lord. It shall belong to the priest who throws the blood of the peace offerings. And then what we're really familiar with, which many have speculated on, debated on, what does this mean? It'll make more and more sense to, to us as we move forward, as we gain a better understanding of what's going on here. But let's go ahead and read it. You shall count seven full weeks from the day after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering. You shall count 50 days to the day after the seventh Sabbath. Then you shall present a grain offering of new grain to the Lord. You shall bring from your dwelling places two loaves of bread to be waved made of two tenths of an ephah. They shall be of fine flour, and they shall be baked with leaven as first fruits to the Lord. Leviticus 23, verses 15 through 17. What we're going to see here is that there's actually another name for the Feast of Weeks and Pentecost. And the Feast of Unleavened Bread and the Feast of Weeks overlap. Now, if you've only understood the Feast of Weeks as being Pentecost itself and not quite grasping that the Feast of Weeks is just that. It is a Feast of Weeks 
begins when Jesus Christ returns after being offered up as the wave sheaf. These two feasts overlap. And what God is demonstrating is that another name for the Feast of Weeks, along with Pentecost, it's the Feast of Leavened Bread. And that will become more and more evident. The first fruits are leavened. To recap, God demonstrates what he's showing us through physical shadows. The characteristics of sourdough, the characteristics of leaven itself, they reveal a process that we must go through as individual Christians. It is a process. It is not static. In this process, it reveals how we are to have the old leaven removed from our lives. But this is just an initial process. And this process reveals how we are to have all of our old ideas, our concepts, our belief about the nature of God, our perceptions of Him. All this knowledge that we've gathered all of our lives, it has to, it has to go. And as we'll see later, it's God that initiates this process. It is God who calls us. He makes it happen, not us. And in this process, there is no discernment. We cannot pick and choose. Our minds have become so corrupted that we can't discern. It is impossible. Everything must go. That is, we must die. It is complete. Only then can we become a new lump. It's only then that we can receive the true understanding that God gives us through Jesus Christ in order to become a new man, resurrected in Christ. As we connect more and more and more of the dots, this will become crystal clear.